Luke chapter 19. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem to be crucified. Uh, as he has just told his disciples, he said, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all of the things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he will be delivered up to the Gentiles, he'll be mocked, spitefully entreated, spit on, and they'll scourge him and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. But they understood none of these sayings. They were hid from them, and neither did they know the things which were spoken. He's probably just about a week away from crucifixion. He's going to Jerusalem for the very purpose, to be crucified, knowing what is waiting him. It is interesting, at this point, the disciples were still anticipating his setting up his kingdom immediately. And they really, when he would talk about his death, it would just not penetrate. Uh, and talking about his resurrection. They just didn't get it. There seemed to be a spiritual blindness uh, to these remarks of Jesus. Now, he has been coming from Galilee, passing through Samaria, and the mystery is, why would he go down to Jericho, because it would be much closer just to come directly from Samaria and continue on to Jerusalem through Samaria. But he made a detour and came down to Jericho. And I think in chapter 19, we discover the reason for his detour to Jericho. When we get to the book of John, we find that uh, it said that they must needs go through Samaria. They were going from the feast in Jerusalem back on up to the Galilee. And it said they must needs go through Samaria. An interesting scripture because Samaria is where they usually did not want to go. Uh, it was sort of a hostile area to the Jews. And so they would avoid going through Samaria. And as we read, he must needs go through Samaria. We can't quite understand that because the general route would be to go down to uh, Jericho and then up the Jordan Valley if you were going to uh, go from Galilee to Jerusalem. But we do find out in John's Gospel that when they came to Samaria, Jesus met the Samaritan woman at the well and the conversion of many Samaritans on that journey. And so we understand why he had to go through Samaria. It was because there were hungry hearts. I believe that this coming to Jericho the main purpose was there was a man in Jericho, a man of bad reputation, but a man who had a curiosity to really know more about Jesus. And I think that Jesus made this detour down to Jericho and from Jericho on up in order that he might meet this man in chapter 19. So Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was a chief among the publicans. He was one of the head tax collectors, and he was rich. Tax collectors were considered traitors. They were collecting taxes for the Roman government, and uh, they would be assigned a territory, and the Roman government would uh, tell them, 
uh, the amount of taxes that they wanted from that particular area. And they had to provide to Rome uh, the taxes that were required. Anything that they could collect over the required taxes was theirs to keep. And so they became notorious scoundrels, men who would just force the people uh, into higher taxes or take their property from them. And they had a very bad reputation. Uh, they were usually known as the shysters of the community and hated by the people. He was the chief of the publicans. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was. But he could not because of the crowd and because he was little of stature. So here he is, a little powerful man, a tax collector, wanting to see Jesus, but he's got a problem. The crowd around Jesus, uh, he's too short, but yet also he dare not to enter the crowd because if he would get in a crowd, the people would nudge him, elbow him, kick him, hit him, uh, and, and he just wouldn't dare to mingle in a crowd. And still the curiosity, uh, there was that hunger uh, to see Jesus. And so he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him because he was to pass that way. He observed the uh, direction that Jesus was going, ran ahead of the crowd, climbed to the sycamore tree where he would be safe from mingling with the crowd but where he could at least see Jesus as he was passing by. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he saw him. And he said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at your house. I wonder what he thought when Jesus called him by name. And Jesus inviting himself to his house. It says he made haste, he came down and received him joyfully. He was excited, excited to meet Jesus, received him joyfully. And when they saw it, that he was going to be a guest of a man that was a sinner, they began to murmur, that is, uh, the Pharisees and uh, that religious crowd, uh, they were murmuring against him. And Zacchaeus stood and he said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusations, I restore him fourfold. So the, the encounter with Jesus transformed his life. And rather than now being a crook and defrauding people, he is giving half of his wealth to the poor and restoring to those that he had defrauded four times the amount. And if I and Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of those who believe, the father of the faithful. And, and so he is acknowledged that salvation has come to his house by Jesus. And then Jesus declared his purpose for coming. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save those who were lost. So these people that were murmuring against Jesus because he had gone to visit with this man who was a notable sinner, uh, Jesus is now declaring, this is what I came for. This is my purpose, to seek and to save those who are lost. And as they heard these things, 
he added and spoke a parable because he was near to Jerusalem. Uh, Jericho was only about 19 miles from Jerusalem. And so he is speaking now this parable. And because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Now, as the disciples were going with Jesus to Jerusalem, they had high hopes that the, the kingdom was now going to be set up. They were, they were anticipating the immediate establishment of the kingdom. And so Jesus gives them a parable with that kind of a background. They're thinking that the kingdom would immediately appear. He said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he said, therefore, a, uh, and he called his 10 servants, delivered unto them 10 pounds. And a pound is uh, English money. And he said unto them, occupy until I come. And I do think that this is the word of the Lord to us today, is to occupy until he comes. I don't think that there was ever an intention of the Lord that we should just uh, say, well, uh, you know, uh, let's just wait and see what's going to happen. And uh, I think that he intends that we should occupy, that we should be busy. Uh, he said in another parable, blessed is that servant. When his Lord comes, he finds him so doing, taking care of the things that needed to be done. I don't think that there's ever a time when uh, we should just uh, say quit our jobs or quit our uh, educational processes because the Lord is coming so soon. We don't know how soon. And until he does come, I think that he expects us to occupy, uh, to stay busy, to continue uh, until he does come. Now, it is interesting in those days that oftentimes when a man was to receive uh, a kingdom uh, or over, uh, to rule over a kingdom, uh, they would go to Rome uh, to receive the blessing of uh, the emperor in Rome. Uh, when King Herod died and uh, the kingdom was divided into, uh, unto his three sons, uh, Archelaus, the one son of Herod, went to Rome uh, and got the blessing of the uh, emperor in Rome and came back and began to rule over a third part of the kingdom that his father had been ruling over. And so when Jesus is talking about a nobleman uh, going to a far country to receive the kingdom, uh, in their minds, uh, that was a, a very fresh experience. They knew what had happened as far as uh, Archelaus was concerned. And so uh, it, it was a parable that sort of uh, resounded in their own minds, uh, and, and they could understand it. But his citizens hated him. And when Archelaus went to Rome to receive the kingdom, there were 50 Jews that also went to Rome to object uh, to his receiving the kingdom. Uh, they petitioned the emperor. They said, we don't want him to rule over us. And so uh, the story sort of ties with what had just transpired a few years earlier in their own history. And, and thus uh, the, the parable is, is really uh, being applied in their minds. The citizens hated him, sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. Now, in this parable, Jesus is the one who is going to the Father to receive the kingdom. And he is going to return. Uh, but the people objected to Jesus reigning. They crucified him. They basically said, we will not have him to rule over us. It came to pass that when he returned, 
having received the kingdom. Then he commanded the servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then the first came and said, Lord, your pound has gained 10 pounds. He said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because you have been faithful in a very little, have authority over ten cities. Now, it does appear in the scripture that when Jesus comes back to establish his kingdom here on the earth, we will be coming back with him. And the Bible says that we will live and reign with him upon the earth. But it would appear that the uh, authority that will be granted to us in returning, uh, the amount of responsibility will be measured by how well we have used what the Lord has entrusted to us. It is required of a steward that he be faithful. And uh, here is the one man, and he is now given rule over ten cities uh, because of his diligence, his faithfulness in using what was entrusted to him by his master. Another came saying, Lord, uh, your pound has gained five pounds. And so he said unto him, Be thou over five cities. But another came and he said, Lord, behold, here is your pound, which I've kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee, because you're an austere man. You take up that which you did not lay down, and you reap that which you did not sow. He said unto him, Out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew uh, that I was an austere man, taking up that which I did not lay down and reaping that which I did not sow. Wherefore did you not put my money in the bank that I might at least got my money with interest? And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that has the ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he already has ten pounds. Jesus said, But I say unto you, that unto every one that hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that which he hath shall be taken away from him. For those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring them hither, and slay them before me. So a parable that deals with the coming kingdom, Jesus in heaven to receive really the kingdom from the Father. One day he will return and we will be brought before him uh, to uh, give an account for what we have done with what he has entrusted to us. Thinking of that, Where do you suppose you will stand when the Lord returns? How faithful have you been in overseeing what God has entrusted to you? Uh, what, have, what are you doing with, with what God has entrusted unto you? Are you using it wisely? Are you uh, seeking to expand uh, the uh, work of the kingdom of God? Uh, or are you just sort of... Uh, you know, sort of hiding or <laughs> hiding the, under the bushel or whatever and uh, just trying to get by. Uh, there used to be a song that, uh, it, I'm glad it never got really popular, but uh, it, 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 it used to sing it in the church. Uh, I can remember it, hearing it when I was young. And uh, the song, the lyrics went something like, if I can just make it in. And, you know, there are some people that sort of have that kind of a attitude. If I can just make it in, I'll be satisfied. If, if I can just make it in. Well, the Bible encourages us to have an abundant entry into the kingdom of heaven. I don't want to just make it in. Uh, Paul said that 
They that run in a race run all, and only one receives the prize. So run that you might obtain. I want to win the prize. And, uh, I, you know, I think that we need to have a more aggressive attitude in using what God has given to us to the fullest extent that when the Lord comes and requires of us an accounting of what we have done, we'll be able to give a good account. My desire is to hear his words, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in using that which I gave to you. Good job. And, and I long to hear that. So when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. From Jericho, it's uphill all the way to Jerusalem. Uh, Jericho is in the Jordan Valley there. It's about uh, 1,000 feet below sea level. And uh, Jerusalem is about 2,700 feet above sea level. So he's ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he was come near to Bethphage, Bethage and Bethany, there at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village over against you, in the which at your entering you'll find a colt that is tied, whereon yet never a man has sat. Loose him and bring him. And if any man ask you, Why do you loose him? You shall say unto them, Because the Lord has need of him. And so they that were sent on their way found even as Jesus had said to them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. And so they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon, and they, as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come near, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all of the mighty works that they had seen. This is it. This is the day that Jesus is going to present himself to the nation of Israel as their promised Messiah. The riding on a colt, uh, a fulfillment of the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9, uh, 9, where rejoice, O daughters of Jerusalem, behold, your king cometh unto thee, but he is lowly, he is riding on a donkey. And so Jesus is, as we can see, deliberately setting this up. Now, up until this time, Jesus would not allow a public uh, acclamation of himself uh, or a public acknowledgement as their Messiah. He did reveal it to some on special occasions. Uh, to the woman of Samaria, she said, I know that when the Messiah comes, he's going to teach us all things. And Jesus said, woman, the one who is speaking to you is he. And uh, there at Caesarea Philippi, when he asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? Peter said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed art thou, Simon. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. But there were times when they wanted to acclaim him as Messiah, uh, as he would work the miracles, feeding the multitudes and all. There was that desire to acknowledge him as the Messiah, but he always evaded it because he was waiting for a special day. And that day when he would be presented, coming into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, the identity of the Messiah is, is very obvious, and he is coming amidst the praises of the people. So the disciples were rejoicing, praising God with loud voices for the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the king 
that comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now some of the Pharisees who were among the multitudes said to him, Master, rebuke your disciples. And Jesus answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. This is the day. This is the promised day. This is the day that they have been looking for for 4,000 years, waiting for, when the promise of the Messiah would come, the Redeemer, the one who would redeem them from their sin. This is the day. What a momentous day. The Pharisees saying, Lord, Stop them. They were actually quoting Psalm 118. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, save now, save now. The word Hosanna in Hebrew is save now. And they were crying, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is the king. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Quoting Psalm 118. And the Pharisees recognized uh, that they were acknowledging Jesus as the Messiah, and that is why they said, Jesus, rebuke them. Uh, that's blasphemy. And I'm sort of sorry that he didn't have them hold their peace. I would love to have heard the stones cry out. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it was such a momentous time. The very stones would have cried out. As you come from Bethany, it's on the backside, you might say, of the Mount of Olives, away from Jerusalem, toward the Judean wilderness. And you come over the top of the hill. And coming over the top of the hill from Bethany, as you breach the top of the hill, actually you get a glorious view of Jerusalem. And of course, at that time, uh, the temple of uh, that was built by Herod. Uh, that magnificent temple uh, was standing there on the Temple Mount area, and it would dominate the whole scene coming over the top of, of the Mount of Olives. And here's the uh, city of Jerusalem down below you, uh, and it would be uh, just a marvelous, exciting sight. And so when he was come near, that is over the top of the hill, and now descending uh, on down towards Jerusalem, he beheld the city and he wept over it. He wept because he knew what was going to happen. He knew the Scripture said that he would be despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Even there in Psalm 18, uh, which prophesied of this day of, of his triumphant entry, even there in, in that psalm, uh, it speaks of the stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. And uh, further down in, in the prophecy of David, he says that uh, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord which has showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords even unto the horns of the altar. Uh, Jesus is coming to be sacrificed. And uh, so uh, he knows what's going to happen. He knows that he's going to be refused. He knows he's going to be despised and rejected. But more than that, he knows the consequences that they will pay in rejecting him, offering them salvation, offering himself as their savior. But he can see the tragic consequences of their rejection, and thus his weeping, I believe, is 
over what they are going to have to pay because of rejecting him, the price, the horrible price that they'll be required to pay. For he goes on to say, the day shall come upon thee that your enemies will cast a trench about thee and compass thee all around and keep thee in on every side and they shall lay thee even with the ground, thy children within thee and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. He could see that beautiful temple raised to the ground, not one stone left standing. The children that were playing in the streets, he knew that they would be dashed to death. He knew the terrible devastation that would take place in 70 AD when Titus would come with the Roman troops and level the city because they did not know the day of their visitation, and thus weeping because of the cost that they would have to pay for rejecting him. But I find verse 42 a very interesting verse. As he was weeping, he said, if you had known, even you at least in this thy day, the things which belong to thy peace, but they are hid from your eyes. If you only knew in this thy day. Going back to Psalm 118, the prophecy, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. That wasn't this morning when you got up and you saw that the sun was coming up and it was, looked like it was going to beautiful, be a beautiful day. And you went out and said, oh, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will reach. No, it, it's not today. Uh, it isn't just any day. It was one special day that God had promised that he would send the Messiah to the world. And Jesus is presenting himself as the Messiah in this thy day. Daniel, the prophet, had a visitation from Gabriel the angel who instructed Daniel as to the day that the Messiah would come. The angel said unto Daniel that there are 77 year cycles that are determined upon the nation of Israel uh, to uh, finish the transgression, uh, make an end of sin and to establish uh, the everlasting covenant. And from the time that the commandment would go forth to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto the coming of the Messiah, the Prince, would be 77s or uh, seven sevens and those, uh, well, wait, 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 69 seven year cycles, 483 years. Interesting. During the time that Daniel was prophesying, the Jews were in Babylonian captivity. And the 70 years of promised captivity in the book of Jeremiah were almost over, and that's why Daniel was praying. He knew that the 70 years of captivity were, were coming to an end, and he still had a position of prominence even when the Persians took over uh, from the Babylonians. And so he was, I believe, waiting on the Lord and seeking the Lord, fasting and praying, knowing that he had a position of prominence, uh, wondering maybe God would have me uh, to have some part of the return of the people to the land. And it would appear that God did have a part for him uh, in the initial return. Uh, because uh, Cyrus, who was a friend of Daniel, uh, was the king over the Persian Empire. And uh, Daniel took to Cyrus the prophecy of uh, Isaiah, where 
150 years earlier, Isaiah the prophet had prophesied the name of Cyrus as the king that would do the will of God and the bidding of God. And uh, so in seeing his name in the scriptures, uh, Cyrus gave the commandment uh, that they might go back and to start again the rebuilding of the temple. But the prophecy to Daniel uh, was not the rebuilding of the temple, uh, but it was the restoring of the city of Jerusalem that from that day that that proclamation went forth, it would be uh, this 69, seven-year cycles or 483 years. That particular commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem is told to us in the book of Nehemiah. And in telling us uh, of that commandment, he tells us actually the day that commandment went forth. Uh, he, he gives us uh, dates that we can ascertain that that commandment went forth in March 14, 445 BC. Some 83 years later, is when Jesus made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem on the day 483 years from the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. So it's an exciting prophecy. And it is interesting that Jesus said, if you had only known at least in this thy day. He waited for this day. Uh, it, the timing was perfect. This was the day that was prophesied that the Messiah would come. But even in the prophecy of Daniel, it said, but the Messiah will be cut off and not receive for himself or not receive the kingdom. And that the Jews would then be dispersed. And of course, we know from history that it followed on through. But the amazing thing of prophesying the very day of the Messiah and, and Jesus is, is lamenting over the fact uh, that they, uh, it was hid from their eyes. If you only knew the peace that you could have. And, and I think that the Lord is still, in a sense, uh, weeping over blindness of people. If you only knew what God would do for you, what God wants to do for you, if you only knew the blessings that you could be enjoying. But unfortunately, with so many people, just as with those in Jerusalem, it was hid from their eyes. They just couldn't see the blessings that God desired to bestow upon them. But with their blinded eyes, they did not receive. And as a consequence, the horrible devastation that they would experience at the hands of the Romans. They will lay you even with the ground, your children within thee. They'll not leave one stone upon another because you didn't know the time of your visitation. And so he went into the temple. Now, this is the next day. He made his triumphant entry on a Sunday. And Mark lets us know that it was the next day he returned to the temple. And he began to cast those out that sold therein and that bought, saying unto them, It is written, My house is the house of prayer. You've made it a den of thieves. It became sort of a bizarre kind of a place. Um, when you paid your temple dues and every Jew was taxed, a uh, half shekel uh, for the temple tax that you had to pay annually. And they would only receive it in shekels, the Jewish money. But shekels were not a popular medium of exchange. Usually they used the Roman coinage. There was also a Greek coinage and a Syrian coinage that was used, but generally the Roman coinage was used. So you came to the temple. You wanted to pay your temple tax, but they wouldn't take Roman coinage. 
And so they had these uh, coin exchanger, money exchangers, and they would exchange your royal Roman money for the Jewish shekel so you could pay your uh, tax to the temple. The only problem is that they charged exorbitant exchange rates so that they were raking money off of people who wanted to give to God what was owed to God. They took advantage of them uh, and uh, made merchandise uh, of these people, uh, enriching themselves uh, with the uh, exorbitant rates of exchange that they were charging. Also, if you wanted to offer a sacrifice to the Lord, uh, you were coming and you wanted to, say, make a sin offering, you wanted to buy a lamb, uh, if you would bring one of your own lambs, they would inspect it carefully and they would find some spot or some blemish because the lamb that was used for a sacrifice had to be without spot or blemish. And so they would examine it with a fine tooth comb, so to speak, uh, to find some spot, and then they would say, we can't let you sacrifice this. And they had certified sacrifices, uh, lambs that supposedly had passed the examinations, but again, they would charge exorbitant rates. Uh, if you wanted to offer a a dove as a sacrifice. Uh, you could buy a dove out in the streets uh, for uh, 50 cents, but they would charge you five bucks for a certified dove. And, and so they were ripping people off, taking advantage of the heart of the people to worship God, to serve God, taking advantage of that which was in the hearts of the people and making merchandise, profiting off of it. And so Jesus said, my house should be the house of prayer. You've made it a den of thieves. And he taught daily in the temple, but the chief priest and the scribes and the chief of the people sought to destroy him. Now, the chief priests were upset. They were Sadducees of the sect of the Sadducees, and they were the materialists. They were the modern liberalists uh, of today, the, the, the liberal theologians that don't believe in the inspiration of the scriptures. They don't believe in um, spirits or angels or resurrection. Uh, they don't really believe that Jesus was necessarily born of a virgin. And, and they were the, the total materialists of the day. But they were the ones also that owned all of these little booths there in the temple grounds where they sold uh, the sacrifices, uh, certified sacrifices, and where they exchanged the money. They, they were the ones that were getting rich off of uh, the people who were coming to worship God. And so Jesus was an enemy to them and they felt they'd got to get rid of him. And so they, they were seeking means by which they might destroy him. And they could not find what they might do because all of the people were very attentive to Jesus. So it came to pass on one of those days as he taught the people in the temple. Now he made his triumphant entry on uh, Sunday. Monday he cleansed the temple, but uh, Tuesday and all he was teaching uh, there in the temple, Monday and Tuesday, people were attentive to him. And as he taught the people and he preached the gospel, the chief priest and the scribes came upon him with the elders. And they spoke unto him, saying, Tell us, by what authority do you do these things? In other words, you've upset the money tables, you've driven the animals out, who gave you the authority to do this? And who is he that gave you this authority? So he answered and said to them, I will ask you one thing, 
and answer me. Uh, sort of like Socrates, he would always answer a question with a question. And so Jesus is following that method. They've asked a question, I'll ask you a question. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or of men? So they reasoned with themselves, saying, if we say it was from heaven, then he will say, why then didn't you believe him? If we say it's of men, then all of the people will stone us because they are all persuaded that John was a prophet. So it was a sort of a catch-22, uh, and they said to Jesus, we can't tell you what it was. And Jesus said unto them, well, neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. And then he began to speak to the people a parable. Now remember, these, these guys are there, the Pharisees and the scribes and all. And so he gives a parable. A certain man planted a vineyard, and he led it forth to husbandmen. Now, a vineyard in a parable-type form is a uh, reference to the nation of Israel. Uh, there is that, uh, in the Old Testament, uh, the parable of the vineyard and uh, God planting the vineyard and putting in it the, the finest of, of, of plants and uh, hedging it about and putting in a wine press and, and all. And when the time came to uh, harvest the vineyard, there were just sour grapes. And, uh, and so the vineyard was just let go. And, and so when Jesus now speaks of a vineyard, uh, they no doubt are thinking of that parable in the Old Testament of the vineyard and realizing that it is the nation of Israel that is being referred to. So this certain man planted a vineyard, and then he uh, leased it out to husbandmen, farmers, and he went into a far country for a long time. And at the season, he sent a servant to the husbandmen that they should give him the fruit of the vineyard. But the husbandmen beat him and sent him away empty. And again, he sent other servants, and they beat them also, entreated them shamefully, and sent them away empty. And again, he sent a third, and they wounded him also and cast him out. Then said the Lord of the vineyard, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It may be that they will reverence him when they see him. But when the husbands saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. What therefore shall the Lord of that vineyard do unto them? He shall come and destroy these husbandmen, and shall give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, God forbid. And he said unto them, What is this then that is written, The stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And the chief priest and the scribes in the same hour sought to lay hands on him, for they feared the people because they perceived, rightly perceived, he had spoken the parable against them. The nation of Israel, God established it. And then God was looking for fruit, waiting a long time, sending his prophets uh, to the people. And they would stone the prophets. They would drive the prophets out. Finally, he said, I will send my own beloved son. Surely they will reverence and respect him. But they said, this is the heir, let's kill him. These fellows were already plotting to kill Jesus. And so Jesus is speaking this parable against them, and they recognize that it is being spoken against them, and it angers them, 
and they are just determined more to destroy Jesus, sought to lay hands. And they watched him. They sent forth spies uh, who would feign themselves as just men, and that they might take hold of his words so that they might deliver him under the power and the authority of the governor. They are trying to sort of trump up charges. They are asking him lead questions. They are trying to trip him up so that they can report to the Roman government uh, that he is an insurrectionist and have him uh, arrested by Rome. And so uh, there came unto him uh, these certain men, and they asked him, saying, Master, and, and they're using flattery now and, and trying to trip him up. They're, they're pretending to be, be really interested. Master, we know that you say and teach rightly. We, we recognize that you're a straight shooter. And neither do you accept the person of any, but you teach the ways of God truly. It's a, it's a deliberate uh, attempt to put him off guard. We understand and we see that you are a straight shooter. You, you're teaching the truth. You don't really worry about man. I mean, you, you just really tell it as it is. Is it lawful for us to give taxes, tribute, to Caesar or not? Now, they think that they have a catch-22 question. If he says, yes, it is lawful to give taxes to Caesar, then the crowd will turn against him because they hated paying taxes to Rome. It was onerous to them. And so if he says, yes, you should, the people will turn against him. If he says, no, you shouldn't, then they'll run immediately down to the Roman, uh, uh, the Roman uh, rulers and they will say, here's a guy that's advocating you know, not paying taxes and have him arrested. So they figure it's, it's you know, they, we've got him. And so Jesus said, he perceived their craftiness, and he said to them, why are you tempting me? Show me a denarius. And so they gave him a denarius. And he said, whose image and superscription hath it? And they answered and said, it's Caesar's. And he said unto them, render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which are God's. And they could not take hold of his words before the people, and they marveled at the answer, and they held their peace. They said, he's got us. <laughs> then came to him certain of the Sadducees, which deny that there is any resurrection. And they asked him, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, If a man's brother die, having a wife, and he die without children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now, there were therefore seven brothers, and the first took a wife, and he died without children. Well, the second took her to wife, and he died childless. And the third took her, and in like manner, seven also. And they left no children and died. You would think that the authorities would be examining the coffee or something that she was serving these guys. <laughs> but then they went on, and finally, the woman also died. Therefore, in the resurrection, Whose wife of them is she? For they all seven had her as a wife. And Jesus answered and said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain uh, that world and the resurrection from the dead will neither marry 
nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, uh, being the children of the resurrection. Now that the dead, now he's just passing off and say that we won't have these same kind of marital relationships in heaven that we have here on earth. Uh, God has a something that is superior, something that is better, and uh, we neither marry nor are given in marriage in heaven. Uh, and uh, just what kind of relationship, we don't know. The Bible doesn't specify. Uh, but you see, the purpose of marriage now is uh, for procreation, uh, to establish a loving environment for children to grow up in, uh, but there will not be that in heaven. Uh, so, uh, but he's tackling now the Sadducees, it, and they, they don't believe in resurrection. But he said, now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush when he called the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. So they are or will be resurrected. Uh, and so certain of the scribes answered and said, Master, that's good. You've said well. Uh, they were always arguing with the Sadducees, and they had not really thought of that particular argument that Jesus gave, uh, which was very good. And after they dared not to ask him any more questions, and he said unto them, how is it that you say that the Messiah is David's son? Uh, remember the uh, blind man in Jericho cried, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David was one of the titles of the Messiah. And so Jesus is calling their attention. Uh, how is it that uh, you say that the Messiah is David's son? And David himself saith in the book of Psalms, the Lord, or Jehovah, said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Uh, David called him his Lord. The Lord said unto my Lord. Uh, that is David, he's referring to the Messiah, my Lord. Sit thou in my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David therefore called him Lord. How is he then his son? In that culture, uh, the patriarch kind of a society, the, the man, the father always ruled. No son would, or no father would call his son Lord. Uh, the son would always refer to the father as Lord, but never the reverse. So here is David, and the Messiah is called the son of David, how is it that David calls him Lord? Then in the audience of all of the people, he said unto his disciples, Beware of the scribes, which desire to walk in long robes. They love the greetings in the markets and the highest seats in the synagogues and the chief room at feasts. Be careful of these guys who are exalting themselves, who are, you know, glad handing, handing people on the, on the streets. They love the greetings. Oh, rabbi, rabbi, or whatever, you know. And he said, which devour widows' houses. And for a show, they make long prayers. The same shall receive the greater damnation. So his warning against those who were scribes, Pharisees, and uh, they devour widows' houses. They, their prayers are all for show, not genuine prayers. They're going to receive the greater damnation. 
Unto him much is given, much is required. Father, help us to so live our lives that we might be pleasing unto you in all things. Help us, Lord, to so order our lives that when others see our good works, they will glorify you. That we won't do things to draw attention to ourselves or to sort of exalt ourselves before others. But Lord, may our desire always be to bring glory and honor unto you. Bless, we pray, our study of the word as we move into these next few chapters in Luke, the chapters that tell us of your death, the chapters that tell us of what's going to be happening here in our world in the next few years. Lord, we just pray that our hearts will be open to receive your word, to receive your truth, that we might walk, Lord, in your truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Shall we stand? The pastors are down here at the front to pray for you and for your needs, whatever they might be tonight. The Lord wants to work in your life. And, you know, it's a tragedy when God is wanting to do a work, even as with Jesus, uh, the people were just sort of hard-headed and blinded to what the Lord was desiring to do. I pray that that will not be your case, but that you will be open to all that God desires and that you will be receptive uh, to receive from him and so these men are down here to pray for you tonight. And whatever your need might be, feel free to come on down and let them minister to you this evening uh, as God wants to work a special work in your life. And so you have not because you ask not so many times. So we encourage you, as Jesus did encourage, ask. And, and it's sort of uh, in, a, in the Greek, it's, it's an imperative. Ask Please ask that you might receive, that your joy may be full. Inviting you to ask, to please ask, that your joy might be full. So whatever need you might have, God wants to meet that need. And these men are here to pray for you that you might experience God's work in your life. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory 